Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is David Halperin. I am the CEO of Israel Policy Forum. Thanks so much for joining us. Over the course of the last nearly 12 months since the October 7 attacks, there has been an ongoing lingering question and maybe even an expectation that at some point there would be an escalation of the simmering conflict in the North. Ever since October 8th, Hezbollah has been firing rockets on Israeli civilian communities along the northern border, leading to the displacement of tens of thousands of Israelis. And this question of whether Israel would continue um, to uh, avoid um, an escalated conflict in the north while a terrorist organization with a substantial uh, 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 stockpile of rockets were threatening Israeli communities and indeed finding new ways through drone attacks and otherwise uh, to attack those communities. Of course, this comes to a head over the summer with the horrific murder of a dozen children in Majd al-Shams in the north of Israel and has escalated further in recent days where Israel has once again demonstrated remarkable intelligence um, through what was a spectacular attack using pagers and walkie-talkies um, to, uh, uh, to um, attack a thousands of Hezbollah uh, fighters inside Lebanon and has continued with targeted airstrikes that by many reports have eliminated a significant cadre of Hezbollah's uh, top leadership. So where do we go from here as we appear to enter into a new chapter of this conflicts that began with the Hamas attack on October 7? And as we look to answer that and many, many more questions, we could not be uh, more thrilled to check in with Ksenia Svetlova, who um, is the first person that I think of when uh, thinking about this escalation with Hezbollah and wanting to understand uh, these uh, developments and what they may mean going forward. Ksenia, of course, is a former member of Knesset and a former journalist who has reported in the past from southern Lebanon. She is today uh, a, a Middle East expert on a wide range of regional uh, issues uh, in her role as executive director of ROPES, the Regional Organization for Peace and Economic Security, uh, where she is uh, following all of these developments quite closely. Well, there are so many questions to get into, and I want to make sure that all of you are part of this conversation. Um, please use the uh, uh, chat function, the question Q&A function in uh, Zoom. You all are familiar with this by now. Uh, we will try to get to as many questions uh, as we can as part of today's discussion. And thank you all once again for joining. Uh, and thank you, Ksenia, for joining us once again um, uh, with Israel Policy Forum. Uh, Ksenia, could you just give us a sense of where we are at today? Um, since the uh, sort of remarkable pager episode, what led to the pager episode, but really where, where are we at since then uh, with these targeted strikes? Oh. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I mean, you know, all of us would wish to talk about other things and not about uh, the looming war. Uh, but uh, it is what it is, and uh, we have to get to the bottom of this and understand uh, what is the strategy and uh, uh, how Israel can achieve its goal 
uh, to get back uh, its residents uh, to northern Israel and to restore security and stability in this uh, part uh, of uh, Israel. That is basically right now depopulated. We are talking about almost 100,000 of Israelis uh, who left uh, their houses. We are talking about the first wave of those who were evacuated uh, after 10-7. Uh, when Hezbollah basically joined Hamas and started attacking Israel unprovoked. Uh, and there is a second wave because we see that right now when the range of attacks is expanding, uh, there are more Israelis that uh, also do not feel safe and secure. And they're taking the children, rightfully so, uh, and they travel to the center of the country or Jerusalem uh, in order to provide security for their families. So during the last two days, uh, we have seen, we witnessed uh, remarkable uh, attacks uh, of uh, Hezbollah uh, targets uh, all over southern Lebanon, uh, according to the IDF, uh, more than 1,500 targets were hit. Uh, we saw how uh, the weapon depots in uh, southern Lebanon, in the Lebanese villages, are going up, uh, being blown up, uh, and you see, uh, you hear the sound of uh, the booms uh, that are characteristic uh, to weapons that uh, explode. Uh, we know that, and we know that for many years, uh, that, uh, well, basically Hezbollah uh, uh, rooted himself uh, very much in the southern Lebanon, and it uh, paid a lot of money uh, to local uh, people uh, while uh, renting from them uh, the first uh, floors uh, or the uh, underground facilities uh, at their houses. Uh, and uh, IDF uh, kept uh, collecting information about uh, this uh, homemade uh, weapon depots uh, and storages and so on. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that uh, I felt yesterday that it was the time when all of this intel came you know, into uh, action. Uh, and uh, the targets that were hit, there were many of them surgically uh, you know, uh, uh, treated. And uh, the attempt was, of course, to hit as, uh, only the military uh, uh, facilities. But of course, since they are a part of uh, the civil infrastructure. I mean, they are skillfully, of course, uh, based, uh, you know, near to schools and uh, hospitals and uh, and houses, just like in uh, Gaza Strip. Uh, the southern Lebanon is less dense. It's not as uh, densely populated uh, as uh, as Gaza is, but still, nevertheless, uh, you see in some of the villages uh, that, uh, you know, the buildings are uh, very crowded. They are one next to each other. And then, of course, uh, inevitably, uh, you will have the after effect. If you hit one building, then some more of them will uh, probably fall. Um, there were also precise strikes uh, in Beirut, in the southern quarters specifically of uh, the Hezbollah held uh, quarters. Uh, these quarters, David, you know, this what's interesting about them is uh, when you enter, and I had the possibility, I had an opportunity to twice visit Lebanon in the 2000s, uh, and uh, you get there and you immediately encounter Hezbollah security. Uh, so it's not a state Lebanese security, it's not the police, it's not uh, you know some uh, Lebanese army. You have Hezbollah security that is, they're checking everyone uh, who is entering uh, these quarters uh, and they're following the people who are there uh, in order to understand the security is very, very tight. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, there was uh, you know precise information uh, about military leaders of Hezbollah uh, among them, number three, uh, Ibrahim uh, Karki, uh, that uh, there was an assassination attempt yesterday. We don't know yet uh, what was its result because uh, Hezbollah is trying to lay low and not to you know, disclose uh, the details. Uh, and there was another one today, the head of the missile uh, uh, department uh, in Hezbollah was, uh, was hit. Um, and uh, what we see from the other side is that uh, I can even use the word restrain. I mean, Hezbollah definitely widens the range of its attacks. And nevertheless, it's nowhere close to the fury that was anticipated in Israel. Uh, my guess is, and again, you know, we can only guess that although many of the uh, places where the rockets, uh, also the precision rockets and the far range uh, missile, uh, missiles uh, were hit, uh, Hezbollah still has a lot of them, thousands, many thousands of them, uh, closer to 100,000 of them. And they definitely have the capability also to hit Tel Aviv and also to hit uh, other places uh, in uh, in our country. The IDF specifically said uh, yesterday that, uh, you know, Israelis should uh, embrace uh, to this moment and it might come. Uh, why it didn't come now uh, is I believe that there are two reasons. 
First of all, there is immense pressure on Hezbollah in Lebanon uh, not to start a war, a white war. I mean, you know, the, to have something simmering uh, and to have Israeli north that to populate it, I mean, yeah, most of Lebanese can live with that. Uh, but uh, 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 to expand uh, this war, which would mean, of course, the destruction of uh, uh, objects of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lebanese infrastructure, uh, probably also the airport, uh, probably also the whatever electricity that is left right now in Lebanon and so on. And I can tell you that uh, there is there is pressure. Uh, and uh, another factor that is, uh, I would be happy to expand on that later, uh, it's of course the Iranian factor. The Iranian president is currently in uh, GAUN uh, in New York. Uh, and uh, we hear various uh, uh, reports uh, from uh, Israeli media, Arab media, American media as well, about uh, the intentions of the Iranian delegation, uh, their readiness uh, to negotiate again with the United States, the nuclear deal, and perhaps also other things. So it seems that uh, there is a coordination between Hezbollah and between Tehran. I mean, there is always uh, this coordination, but right now uh, uh, there is a decision to restrain uh, their response uh, also to the pager attack, also to what happened yesterday and today. Uh, and uh, uh, while Haifa and, and cities like Atlit, for example, became also uh, uh, inside the circle of uh, fire of Hezbollah, uh, nevertheless, we still did not uh, uh, see from them the last word. Uh, we still uh, did not see the really massive uh, attacks uh, with uh, much uh, serious and heavy rockets uh, that they promised to fire uh, in case, uh, you know, uh, uh, the all-out war will break loose. Again, my sense is that we are not there yet. We are not there yet. And while we definitely see uh, an escalation, uh, uh, there is still a chance, perhaps, to undo it. Uh, and perhaps uh, reduce it uh, to prevent uh, the regional war that everybody is speaking about. So I think it's important to understand what what does further escalation look like? Um, I think you, you began to touch on this, you know, the knowledge that Hezbollah has a sig significant stockpile of long range missiles and that the decision whether to deploy them is ultimately sitting in Tehran. You know, I've always thought of Hezbollah's stockpile as essentially Iran's uh, deterrence against Israel striking Iran's nuclear facilities. Um, that it sort of uh, serves as an Iranian uh, deterrent capability. And the question is, are they prepared to expend that that capability uh, at this moment? Is is that the calculation? What would trigger, um, in your view, this Hezbollah response? How would we know if we are on the verge of wide scale war as we follow the events? Um, as, as they move forward? Well, you know, I think that two uh, developments uh, might be um, an indication that uh, uh, the Iranians will give eventually the green light, actually free. Uh, if we'll start with Iran, then of course it's the failure to reignite the negotiations uh, with American administration about the GCPOA. So uh, we see right now kind of expression of, I would know it, I don't know if you can call it really goodwill, uh, nothing is a goodwill when we are talking about the Iranian regime, which is murderous and dangerous uh, to the whole region, not only to Israel. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that uh, uh, the current president, uh, Masoud Pazizkian, uh, he was a man of choice for Khamenei for a reason. And the reason was that uh, they need badly uh, this deal to come back uh, and for some sanctions to be elevated and because they need to uh, uh, infuse money into Iranian economy. So this is first. If this will fail, you know there is no reason to you know hold off uh, the response. Uh, as for developments in Lebanon itself, well, I think that uh, if we will see an expansion of uh, strikes uh, against not only Hezbollah targets but all Lebanese targets, uh, which I mean is that uh, you know there could be much more serious attacks in Dakhia, uh, like uh, you know what we saw in uh, 2006 uh, when basically you know the quarter was uh, badly hit and. Um, you know, Gaza style, if you wish. And uh, and uh, uh, this is clearly something that Hezbollah, I don't know if they would be ready to tolerate something like this and not respond by a much more massive uh, fire. Uh, and uh, another one is, of course, uh, the infrastructure in Lebanon itself, major highways, uh, an airport, uh, what is remaining of the ports. We know that uh, the port of Beirut was destroyed in mysterious uh, 
uh, uh, blow up a few years ago and uh, that Hezbollah probably had something to do with. Uh, but there are other ports that, you know, still uh, are operating and they allow them to export weapons and uh, uh, other things that are essential to continue the warfare. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, I think that uh, this is the second. So basically, if the Iranians, if, and if Hezbollah themselves, they will feel that uh, Israel is not only drawing blood, uh, some blood, uh, which hurts, but I mean, you know, this is uh, not the end of Hezbollah. We'll understand, you know, that if you kill number three, then number four will become number three. You know, this is something that uh, they always do. Uh, but if there will be really an existential threat to the continue of existence of uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, which is important, of course, regionally, because that's the pillar of Iranian uh, hegemony uh, in country like Syria, you know, it's something that uh, Hezbollah uh, allowed them to achieve a, a victory uh, over the Syrian opposition during the civil war. And it still allows them to control some of the restive parts uh, 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 of Syria. So uh, this is something that uh, I believe that would be a, a red line, you know. So ground invasion, for example, might be just that, you know. So this is something that is now uh, uh, currently discussed uh, in Israel in every possible level military, mm -hmm. governmental, uh, parliamentary, uh, media, and so on. Uh, and um, yeah, yeah, this is something that definitely uh, could trigger something more. And again, David, you know, I think that the main question here is what Israel wants. Yeah. Uh, what is the goal? You know, so if you define the goal as uh, 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 providing for security and stability on Israeli borders for a long term, not just for the next few months or something like this. There's something that will allow to bring people back, but then will, they will be again, you know, under threat of invasions, uh, terror, terror acts, uh, kidnappings, and uh, and of course uh, rockets and uh, 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 drones. Uh, so then, you know, yeah, this is something that uh, it's a short-term goal, and this is something that would definitely not be enough. If you are talking about the change of completely of reality in southern Lebanon. Well, for that, I believe that you would need much more than uh, right. just a military operation. You would need a lot of diplomacy uh, and perhaps a grand deal uh, that would also include Iran. And what? And I wonder if we could unpack that because I think you just outlined a very clear path towards escalation. And I wonder what de-escalation looks like be, uh, picking up on that because clearly the goal is to return those you know, 70,000 plus Israelis to their homes in, in the North, but you know, if there is not a military conflict, of course, we're going to see Hezbollah remaining with rockets that certainly can rain down on those communities, if not uh, those deeper inside Israel. Um, is there a diplomatic path here that Israel can live with and what would it look like? Well, you know, for now, we hear from the politicians, at least, uh, you know, that uh, the goal is, uh, first of all, decoupling between uh, Gaza and southern Lebanon. So we will hit Hezbollah, you know, as hard as we can until it will uh, stop uh, firing rockets. So, you know, this is, again, this goal is, it might seem as an attainable goal. Uh, from everything that we know about Hezbollah, you know, it indicates that uh, they will not uh, succumb to this pressure. Uh, even right now, if uh, Hezbollah, if Nasrallah, the leader of uh, this organization, uh, is isolated, and even if he lost all of his uh, commanders, and uh, even if they cannot communicate uh, normally because, uh, you know, they are afraid of security breach, and obviously they cannot use uh, whatever they were using before. Uh, nevertheless, uh, again, you know, this is a, a much more aggressive and well-organized organization than Hamas. Uh, I think that, you know, you, you need to understand that. And Israel was never lightheaded about Hezbollah, as it was, unfortunately, about Hamas. And uh, this is a different level. Everybody understands this, you know. So I think that, uh, you know, after a few successes uh, last week and, you know, during the last two days, it's easy to say, well, you know, like, you know, it seems that we are doing something right. And uh, therefore, the consequences might be to our satisfaction. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we will find out soon enough that it's unfortunately not the case. Hezbollah had this steadfast in the Arabic, you call it sumud, uh, it's a Palestinian term, but also, of course, Hezbollah use it, you know, it's something that long, long breath, you know, so even if you're bleeding, even if you're fighting, uh, you have to continue and you have to readjust, you know, so the, I think that uh, the route to de-escalation, well, you know, it lies, first of all, through Gaza, 
you know, this is first and foremost. And while we are concentrating in our talk today uh, on the northern border, of course, I would like to remind that, uh, you know, the first and ultimate goal of Israel in this war is, of course, the return of hostages. And there are still 101 hostages in Gaza. At least half of them are alive. This is according to the prime minister recently. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's our duty, first of all, to bring them home, which might, of course, uh, you know, come down the northern uh, front. Um, I do think that um, while it might be it was enough in the beginning of the war, uh, now these days, uh, after, you know, this year of uh, constant fighting uh, and uh, human casualties also in Israel, the Majdal Shams kids, uh, but also other civilians uh, that were hit uh, by Hezbollah rockets, uh, and drones, uh, this is not enough. Uh, we need a change of situation. We need to change of, uh, you know, security uh, outlook uh, in this whole border, you know. So uh, again, you know, uh, 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 since you cannot really negotiate with uh, Hezbollah, you know, this is not a choice, just like you cannot negotiate with Hamas, really, uh, long term, at least, you know, something that of a long term, uh, then I think that the international community, of course, uh, you know, has to play a significant role uh, everybody is speaking about uh, reviving the UN uh, Security Resolution uh, 1701, uh, but I have to tell you that even that would not be enough at this point, uh, because while uh, when uh, this uh, resolution was drafted, uh, there were no drones uh, at his ballot disposal, and now they have thousands of them. Uh, so this is, uh, well, you know, this is something that... Uh, yeah, and we're yeah. referring to the UN resolution that ended the 2006 conflict that moved Hezbollah in theory was supposed to move Hezbollah north of the Tani River and uh, demilitarize everything south. So the question, and we have a lot of questions and appreciate them all, and please keep them keep them coming because I'm going to try to consolidate some of the different questions that have come in from uh, members of the audience. Um, Bob Sugarman, Alex Kanner are both asking about this, this, you mentioned earlier the discourse inside Israel about the necessity or not of a ground campaign, and I think the the the, the core question is, you know, to create circumstances where Hezbollah is at least north of the Tani River. You just may, perhaps indicated that that will be insufficient, but is it possible if there is not a de-escalation, no path to diplomacy? Is it possible to achieve these military gains? without a full-scale ground invasion? And what's the state of the discourse in Israel about that question? Yeah, well, uh, this is quite clear that, uh, again, you know, like everything else in Israel, uh, you know, the society is divided very much uh, between the two camps, uh, the camp of the prime minister and those who oppose him and his policies. Uh, so you would hear a lot of support for a ground uh, operation in the camp of those uh, who, in general, uh, support the... Uh, uh, the you know the main pillars of uh, the policy of current policy uh, of uh, Netanyahu's government uh, in Gaza and also in the north. Uh, though you know I have to say that even there you know there are exceptions and there are people who still very much uh, you know remember uh, Israeli presence uh, in Lebanon that lasted for eighteen years between uh, nineteen eighty two and uh, the two thousands, uh, and uh, uh, this was a painful experience that also did not really provide security. Uh, to anyone, because, uh, you know, the uh, soldiers uh, paid the price, uh, but also civilians did, because Israeli territory was uh, attacked, of course, from southern Lebanon, despite uh, the presence of uh, Israeli army there. Uh, so, uh, again, like with everything else, we are divided, David. Uh, again, I can tell you, you know, uh, you know, as an expert, I think that for Israel, um, that would be extremely dangerous to be drawn again, uh, to this uh, military adventure uh, in the reckless sense of it, uh, with the unknown outcome, uh, because that would be a bloody guerrilla war. And uh, while, you know, uh, Israel is still fighting in Gaza, and it still cannot really say that, you know, it achieved the total victory there, you know, so the situation southern Lebanon will obviously will be very different. Uh, and uh, while you know, you know, how you enter this place, you might never know, you know, how and when you will be getting out. Uh, and, uh, you know, since we know the nature of this specific government, we also can assume that uh, once uh, there are boots on the ground in some place, uh, there will be uh, resistance inside the government, uh, uh, you know, in regards to getting uh, these boots out of this ground. 
So that could be a very prolonged and very bloody and dangerous experience. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, David, you know, again, you know, so uh, 1701 uh, was merely enough back then in 2006. Uh, and it was not, of course, uh, followed up and that nobody uh, delivered uh, what was uh, written there. And nobody, of course, not Unifil, not Lebanese government. They don't have such powers, not then and, of course, not now. Uh, so it, Lebanon itself cannot get rid of Hezbollah, not in the southern part, not in any other part. Uh, they just cannot do it, you know. So the question is whether there is an international mechanism uh, that can uh, provide for the realization of, uh, you know, the, the resolutions of Security Council. Because I actually, I think that we would need a new one, uh, an updated uh, 1701. Uh, but then again, you know, this path lies through Iran, through Tehran. Uh, and uh, while we still, it's nothing is clear in regards to the possible communications uh, that the Iranians are having right now uh, with uh, the U.S., uh, it seems to be as maybe the only way to avoid uh, this uh, all-out uh, regional war that everybody is uh, fearing. And I can tell you that also Israeli uh, uh, political echelon, but also the military, uh, are not, uh, you know, uh, entering uh, this uh, this kind of uh, war lightly headed uh, and with great joy uh, because everybody understands what kind of uh, price Israel would have to pay you know so uh, you see from the even this measured escalation of the last two days uh, which is definitely an escalation but we, we know that it could look uh, very differently uh, we see that still 11 months since 10-7 uh, neither Hezbollah nor Israel does not really want a war they do not really want to go into something that can, uh, you know, draw a lot of blood and uh, change completely the uh, strategical uh, position, at least, uh, you know, for Hezbollah, but also for Israel. You know, I, I know you're you're joining us, uh, obviously, as an, uh, as an Israeli, but I'm, I'm curious, you, you mentioned this, the need, uh, the potential uh, for international mechanisms um, to be the diplomatic path out of this. I wonder, you know, if you could give us a sense of what the role of the United States is in this moment. Um, the, the U.S. administration has clearly stated repeatedly that it wants to avoid this sort of regional uh, e escalation, this wider conflict. And Amos Hochstein has been um, engaged in all sorts of diplomacy or, um, uh, to pursue uh, a path forward that would avoid um, the days that we are in now. What can the U.S. do right now um, to, to avoid that escalation even further? I would suggest with starting to getting yourself a strategy. What do you really want to see in the Middle East and how you want to achieve this? You know, so uh, I think that now when you see from on one hand, uh, you have, uh, you know, the American troops that are leaving Iraq, uh, uh, which is seen by Iranians as quite a victory for them and for their proxies in Iraq, for example. And there will be more and more pressure also on the American presence uh, in Syria. Uh, I think that uh, it's... Uh, you know, it's uh, it's rightfully to to ask. Uh, you know, so what what kind of presence uh, does U.S. wants uh, in the Middle East, and uh, how it intends to make sure that uh, uh, you know uh, the you know Iranian hegemony is not growing, uh, and malign actors such as Hezbollah, such as Houthis, uh, they are not uh, just getting away. You know, with uh, every atrocity that have, they have done, and I just have to mention that uh, David that. Uh, you know, while we in, um, you know, in Israel have a long, long uh, account, you know, open account uh, with Hezbollah, you know, that includes everything. The activity abroad against Jewish centers and the uh, uh, Israeli embassies and the tourists in Bulgaria. Uh, and of course, our citizens uh, that died from their rockets and missiles and uh, uh, drones and so on. But uh, so do the Syrians. Uh, and I do see if my friends uh, who had to leave Syria and their friends and family had just disappeared in, you know, Syrian prisons or died uh, by the hand of Hezbollah militias, uh, militants, you know. So I think that uh, for for many of them, you know, this is uh, today what is happening. They uh, they uh, they look at it with, with hope, you know, because uh, Hezbollah is uh, a major power, not only in Lebanon, but also in Syria. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, again, you know, the question of Iranian proxies was actually uh, almost never discussed at the level of the you know policy so what does the u.s us wants to do because gcpoa clearly did not uh, include any reference to that uh, and there were many in israel at the time and i was in the knesset i remember the discussions uh, that uh, you know that were worried that you know there is no 
mentioning of this uh, spread of this uh, Iranian uh, influence uh, across uh, across the region. You know, so whether Iran can be contained uh, in this sense, you know, this is a big question. But if anybody can, you know, like uh, be uh, preoccupied with this question and to work on the viable strategy, it is the U.S. Uh, I don't have an easy solution for you. Uh, um, you know, I think that nobody does. Uh, because we are talking about indeed sophisticated uh, and powerful country that with all of the difficulties I'm talking about Iran still is able to operate a master you know masterpiece of uh, you know web of the terrorist uh, organizations spread around the Middle East that are terrorizing of course Israel uh, and uh, everybody else uh, who stands in the way and uh, of course uh, you know there needs to be some kind of uh, a solution for that you know I think that in general, the question of failed states, and Lebanon is clearly a failed state. Uh, it is a state that it's only a shell is left, but the substance, it's filled with uh, with Hezbollah. So it's, can you still treat this state just like is anybody, a, any other state in the UN? I'm talking about, of course, voting rights in the UN uh, and, uh, and the international law, you know, that applies to Lebanon, although, you know, there is a de facto no Lebanon. There is just Hezbollah land that, uh, that uh, operates today. And we are fighting Hezbollah, we are not fighting Lebanon. Uh, but in a way, Hezbollah became Lebanon. Uh, so uh, so I think that it will be increasingly difficult for Israel to just, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, deal uh, with the spread um, alone, uh, even with significant American support, but still alone. Uh, because this is much bigger, uh, David, than uh, what, you know, we can do in Israel. Because you see the spread, geographical spread from Yemen to Iraq. You know of this network, uh, and the, Iran the Iranians uh, will spare no, uh, you know, uh, dime or no money on that. They will continue this training them and building more, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, dreadful uh, networks that will threaten us, threaten the Gulf, uh, threaten uh, any moderate Arab country uh, and population. Yeah. So I mean, it seems there's like a triangle of questions. What it, what what are the strategies of the United States, what does the United States actually want for this region and how it wants to deploy them is also a question of Iran and uh, its strategies. And lastly, of course, Israel. And if how is it uh, comfortable? Uh, what is actually victory or winning uh, in returning those residents to the north in a way that's actually sustainable and in which they're not threatened over the long term? It's very hard to see this sort of Rubik's Cube aligning um, without this uh, situation escalating even further. We have a number of the questions, and I apologize for not acknowledging each person because there are, so far have been about 30 questions in the queue, um, but there is a group of questions that are really about uh, Gaza and whether uh, Israel could actually de-escalate the North by unilaterally declaring a ceasefire in Gaza, a proposal that has been raised in the past by Dennis Ross of the Washington Institute. Um, and, and if that would be a strategy to actually halt the situation in the North from wider escalation. And I think behind that question, there's a number of other questions related to it, which is um, the extent to which Israel's actions in the North are also driven uh, less by the national interest than Netanyahu's political interest. Um, in extending the era of conflict. I wonder if you could talk about both of those, Israel's strategy vis-a-vis -vis Gaza and this question of a ceasefire as a solution to tamping down tensions. And the second is the extent to which Netanyahu's political interests um, can be viewed in the events of the last few weeks and, and going forward. Well, uh, you know, on the first question, I would have to say again, regretfully, uh, I do not believe that the current government has a strategy uh, in Gaza. Uh, and uh, it's the task of the government, not of the army, because the army had already announced that they achieved all of their goals, you know, dismantling the Hamas brigades, uh, neutralizing their tunnels, blowing them up, uh, uh, locating all of the you know, weapon depots and so on. Uh, and you see that uh, we enjoy a relative quiet in the South uh, during the last, I think it's been 11 days now. Uh, I hope, you know, there will be no unpleasant surprises uh, just because we jinxed it. But uh, uh, in any case, uh, you know, you, you, you understand that, you know, the army had achieved what it had to achieve there. But what now? You know, so now it's the task of the government uh, to provide a viable policy uh, that can bring back our hostages, this is first of 
most, uh, and uh, also to create conditions uh, that will allow for a construction of Gaza, and uh, that will allow for bring you know building there uh, some kind of a new uh, regime uh, that uh, will govern uh, Gaza. Uh, uh, without uh, the involvement of, uh, you know, Israel, maybe with some, you know, supervision on the borders and so on, but uh, it should be a Palestinian regime, of course. Uh, you see that uh, the, you know, nature of this government, it is by far, uh, you know, this is a far right, uh, the most far right government that, that we've ever seen. A uh, prime minister who is, of course, interested to, you know, continue uh, uh, heading this government and to make it last to the end of its natural term in 2026, uh, he avoids this kind of conversation. He avoids this kind of uh, discussion. Uh, and we see some attempts, you know, that are laughable at best uh, to basically to discuss, uh, you know, the future in terms of we will not allow this and we will not allow that. This is clear what we will not allow. But what we will allow, <laughs> yeah. No, you know, what should be happening? How do we want to see Gaza? And this is, you know, me asking this question for the last at least 20 years of my journalistic work and then also in Knesset. How do we want to see Gaza? How we want to see relations with Gaza, with Palestinians in general in 20, 25 years from now? So 20 years has passed already since, uh, you know, I covered uh, Gaza and uh, as a reporter and went there myself. Uh, and uh, I was always puzzled by the lack of basically you know, again, strategy, because every military achievement worth nothing, zero, absolute zero, if it does not, uh, you know, it's, if it's not coming as a package uh, with, uh, with strategy. There is no strategy today with Ben Kver and Smutrich in the government. You cannot have this discussion. You cannot really, you know, discuss what kind of Palestinian uh, element would you like to see there, uh, you know, at least on the level of theory. You know, I'm not even talking about practice. Uh, so there is nothing of the kind that is happening there. And uh, therefore, I believe that, well, you know, of course, we can do everything, theoretically. We can unilaterally, you know, declare the ceasefire, but it will not bring back our hostages, we understand, yes? Uh, right. That would be not a deal. It would be unilateral uh, action. Uh, we can uh, right now, uh, you know, uh, we can uh, end, uh, you know, the fighting in Gaza and see if Hezbollah ends the fighting in the north. But it will not dismantle the threat that Hezbollah still poses. Uh, to the uh, residents of uh, of uh, northern Israel, I will just remind uh, to everyone who is present in this uh, 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 discussion right now that uh, the plan to conquer parts of Israeli territory and take uh, hostages uh, and take whole communities as hostages, uh, it was actually Hezbollah plan. And Hezbollah, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've I've seen the, for the first time a video that they produced with uh, you know the motive of conquering the Galil, the Galilee. Uh, back in 2010, you know, so this was, you know, initially their plan. And uh, while, you know, now, you know, that we know that something like this, uh, you know, is really possible, uh, then we are better prepared, of course, and so on. But still, uh, uh, you know, just the, you know, promise that, yes, we will prevent it because now we know, you know, what are their intentions that are not, they're not enough to mothers uh, and fathers uh, and, uh, you know, families uh, who, you know, saw the atrocities that were, performed uh, in uh, in, in uh, the southern communities of Israel uh, by 10-7, and they fear that something like this can happen also to them. So uh, again, you know, so these unilateral actions, you know, they can produce some short-term uh, quiet, but in the long term, if you really want to change, to alter completely uh, the situation in security in the north, this is definitely not enough. Uh, you have to do more. You know, I, I mentioned uh, in regards to the second question, uh, the political interests uh, of Netanyahu, I think that they are clear. Uh, and they were clear, I think, also in the beginning of the war. Uh, you know, the war uh, that unfortunately in the north, you know, uh, me, just like many other Israelis, we do believe that uh, unfortunately, you know, it was forced on us. You know, we didn't choose to escalate on northern border uh, by 10-8. Uh, uh, it uh, happened and uh, Hezbollah continued that. And even if they will stop right now, again, that will not be sufficient uh, to bring back thousands and uh, tens of thousands of Israelis back home. So the war is, in a way, it's inevitable. Uh, or, you know, again, the continuation of the war, normally it should be the political uh, a solution, some kind of uh, a deal uh, that should be reached. Uh, I don't see in the coming future uh, this deal shaping up. Unfortunately, not for now. Maybe in the future, yes. I'm not saying that everything is uh, just that, that we are doomed. Uh, but Netanyahu, definitely, you know, this is something that plays into his hands. 
uh, we didn't hear from him almost nothing about the hostages during the last, uh, you know, at least couple of weeks now. Yeah. He mentioned them briefly, you know, uh, in the close discussion. Uh, but also, or, or even then in Knesset, uh, he just mentioned that really, really, really briefly. And it seems right now that, uh, especially since IDF doing so well, uh, you know, the success always has a lot of fathers, but uh, the failure is an orphan usually. Okay, so uh, while he's not in a hurry to take any responsibility for 107 and the, you know, just uh, unbelievable failure of uh, his policies and, uh, you know, uh, uh, everything else that happened, you know, before that and since then, uh, I think that uh, he will be very interested to continue right now the infighting with the North, uh, even beyond what perhaps, you know, would be necessary uh, in order to just maintain his government, because right now you really, you know, do feel that it's not even clear if uh, there will be a possibility to, for example, uh, uh, continue with the, the demonstrations, uh, not if situation will aggravate. Uh, right now, there are no uh, limitations uh, for people gathering uh, in the center of Israel. There are certain limitations in the north, but in any day, if you will have rockets falling on, you know, some town in the uh, uh, central Israel, then you will have also no demonstrations. And then, you know, it's not something that he did. It just happened. But the result will be positive, okay? So everything is intertwined. And this is why, you know, again, like many other Israelis, this is my personal opinion. Uh, uh, you know, I believe that, uh, you know, he is not uh, uh, capable uh, of making right solutions, of making right decisions, uh, not in the South and not in the North. He should step down. There should be the elections right now, but then he definitely should, should step down a long time ago. I think that's that leads me to uh, another question, which is, you know, when you think about the aftermath of October 7, the horrors of October 7, you also think about the incredible um, solidarity that engulfed Israel and this remarkable response by civil society. But here we are now a year later, and you're describing a situation that could be just the beginning of a much more challenging conflict that has uh, no clear end. Um, frankly, um, what is the state of the Israeli public's preparedness for this sort of long-term, um, very dangerous conflict? Well, uh, David, you know, uh, we are exhausted. Uh, this is the longest war, I think, uh, since the War of Attrition uh, of 69, which is, of course, not as brutal as a dangerous uh, for, you know, also people uh, who are not on the front line. Um, and um, especially, you know, the families where you have uh, 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 reserves, reserve, uh, you know, men in reserve, uh, who are doing their third round and fourth round and now fifth round, you know, so, and if there will be a ground operation, I mean, God knows uh, how long will it take and how, you know, much uh, manpower uh, will be needed for that. Uh, but also in general, you know, so there is exhaustion uh, because we understand that there is no end. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it can continue now for a few months, but also for a few years with low intensity or, you know, sometimes there would be flare-ups. Um, and while the civil society is going very strong, uh, civil society, you know, this is the real Israel, you know, the Israel that uh, we all love, you know, to think about and praise. Uh, uh, it, it, it is what it is, you know, so you see the volunteers that now for, I, I know some that uh, for the year now, almost for one year, they are volunteering with kids uh, from uh, southern Israel that uh, uh, yeah, they were, you know, survivors of 10-7, uh, or even those who were not directly there, but still, you know, they were close enough uh, to suffer from tra trauma. And you see amazing Israelis that are coming, then they're playing with them, and they're taking them to uh, Hugnim uh, and the different activities in the afternoon to let their, you know, parents to have an opportunity to work and to make a living you know, and so on. And uh, you still uh, have a lot of teams, you know, that are doing their very humbly, very quietly, they're doing their work and they will continue to do this. And I know that, you know, there will be, of course, this uh, total mobilization, if God forbid something will uh, happen and the escalation will be much more serious, which is always an opportunity, then we will see it again. But again, on the national level, people are exhausted. And, uh, you know, some, you know, we would just want some normality. Some normalcy going back to the life where you don't think, and should I go to work, you know, because I'm working next to Israeli towers in Israel, in Tel Aviv, 
And of course, you know, if there will be a hit that it might be very close there, and I don't have perhaps a suitable solution for uh, safety at my workplace, you know, because these are the discussions that the people are having uh, in public transportation. So just, you know, over coffee with a friend. Uh, so the, the, you know, the national mood, and again, it's different in different, many different Israels that exist. You know, you would see, find also in some communities uh, this uh, elation and like, finally, we are doing something. Finally, the IDF is uh, achieving uh, some goals. Science, uh, finally, we have some color, you know, in our cheeks, you know, because this is something that. Uh, but uh, I do believe that it's more, it's a kind of a short term excitement. Uh, and uh, while it's absolutely clear, you know, that uh, the enemy uh, is much uh, stronger. Um, and uh, despite the, the blowbacks that it suffered, you know, it's stronger that then, uh, you know, just one or two days of fighting uh, to say, well, you know, we did that and then we can go home and rest, you know. So this is something that, again, Israelis will not, uh, in security wise, they will not agree to go back uh, to the reality that we had prior to 10-7. Uh, in all our borders, this is south and north, you know. So the only, by the way, uh, it's important to mention that the only borders that are quiet, the borders of peace, you know, except for, you know, unfortunate uh, uh, occasions that happened on the North Jordanian border that suffered a terrorist attack. But in general, I'm speaking, yes, uh, this is the Egyptian and the Jordanian border. These are the borders of peace. They are quite borders, okay? So whether we'll be able ever to achieve something like this, you know, with the uh, uh, Gaza uh, and, uh, 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 and the, the northern border and, uh, of course, uh, in the West Bank, well, you know, this is an open question. Um, and it seems like... It seems like we're stuck in a moment where the Israelis are, of course, um, have a moment of opportunity to significantly degrade Hezbollah's command infrastructure and rocket capabilities, but that it may be that this conflict continues uh, without going to the full-scale regional war in the hope that a diplomatic path might be in the offing. And I want, I want to come back to Iran a bit um, to understand sort of what what influences Iran? <laughs> uh, we had a question about you know we've we've had a ongoing you know uh, debate for now years about the threat of military action, the economic sanctions regarding its nuclear program. Uh, we've seen Iran execute in the last year this sort of ring of fire strategy uh, of all of these proxies attacking Israel from all sides. Um, what would you like to see uh, from the international community in terms of addressing um, Iran, its nuclear program, and the threat of these proxies that would uh, change its calculus um, in in a in a in a way that would uh, you know reduce the the threat of of all that war? Yeah, well, first of all, when we are speaking about international community, it's you know quite clear. Uh, that uh, since the world is divided as it is, and we see what is going in regards to the support for Ukraine, for example, uh, it will be also increasingly difficult uh, to to get you know this base of uh, uh, countries not only from the West but also from the global South uh, to support anything. Uh, I'm not talking about military right now, uh, but even diplomatic pressure uh, on uh, uh, Iran. Uh, uh, but uh, there is also not another option. Uh, it has to be done uh, somehow, you know, and I think that, uh, again, you know, while Netanyahu, you know, uh, talked for years about Iran, 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 you know, he always talked about the nuclear danger, uh, which is a real danger. It is a real threat. And uh, also for that, there are no uh, quick solutions. Uh, but all of these years, uh, Iran was building its ring of fire. Uh, and uh, for us, it's a ring, uh, but also it's, it's a you know, significant threat to many of our neighbors. Uh, the Jordanians, for example, are now suffering from that as well. When uh, you have the Syrian uh, drug dealers and also uh, pro-Iranian uh, uh, militia forces uh, basically taking its borders, you know, so uh, Iran is uh, threatening uh, every uh, American ally in the region. Uh, and we saw that very clearly with Saudi Arabia in 2019, uh, when the oil fields in uh, Horais and Abqaiq uh, were attacked and no reaction basically followed, uh, you know, on behalf of the United States. Uh, and uh, it made everybody, you know, think uh, over, you know, their relations with Iran. Uh, not necessarily their relations with the United States, but their relations with Iran. So if, uh, you know, we will not, uh, if we cannot hope for protection, 
So perhaps we have to do nice, uh, you know, with Iran. So you have now Saudi Arabia uh, that uh, achieved a peace deal with Iran uh, through China, you know, for possible countries with China. Uh, and uh, you have also uh, everybody, including Egypt, you know, that uh, did some advances uh, in order to uh, rethink basically their uh, strategy on Iran. So in this condition, yes, I, you know, it will be very difficult, you know, to exercise uh, any kind of pressure. And I mean, there is always the economic pressure because Iran is interested to, uh, you know, restructure its economy, uh, to be less dependent on Russia. They don't like it. You know, it seems to be like a, you know, many believe that it's a, 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 a match made in heaven between Russia and Iran, but there are many grudges there and uh, dissatisfaction, you know, on both sides, by the way, but you have more dependency now of Russia uh, from Iran than the other way uh, around, you know. So uh, I think that uh, uh, there are still economic incentives that might be used possibly. Uh, but I don't know, David, you know, what it will take for Iran uh, to uh, stop funding uh, and perhaps uh, stop uh, uh, exercising military pressure through its regional proxies in the Arab Middle East. Yeah. Uh, because this is one of the core goals of the Iranian revolution. It's the export of Islamic revolution uh, to the outer world. So it's to the Middle East and it's to Africa and so on. So you have the, is this enigma, it's uh, it's engulfed uh, in the very body of the Iranian regime. Uh, whether it can change after perhaps uh, the death of uh, Khamenei, whenever it will happen. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've seen the obituary already in the New York Times a couple of years ago, but he's still with us, uh, obviously. And uh, uh, I don't know if after he will be gone, there will be some change. Definitely, there will be a power struggle. We see uh, somebody uh, like uh, Pesesh Kian right now, the current president, uh, that would obviously would be happy to drive uh, uh, his country in a different direction. I don't know whether he will be powerful enough ever, because the Iranian presidents are never powerful. Uh, to lead their own policy and so on. But perhaps uh, when uh, Khamenei will be gone, you know, there will be a little bit, you know, change uh, there. Uh, and that might be exploited, you know, by the United States and by Europe, uh, because I don't see anybody else uh, who will be uh, really uh, uh, interested in that. Of course, the Arab countries should be interested in that. Right. Uh, but, I, you know, I don't think that they feel secure enough to, you know, definitely not to join this, so-called Middle Eastern NATO, you know, with Israel and not to do anything that might provoke a stronger Iranian uh, uh, reaction, again, through through the process. Yeah, and it seems, you know, there's an open question about how much Israel can prosecute uh, a long-term war in Lebanon that clearly is a proxy war with Iran at the same time that the Europeans are exploring uh, the uh, a renewal of the JCPOA um, in the near term. This, this gets very complicated between more in diplomacy in, in the period ahead. Ksenia, um, we're almost at time, but I'm wondering what what's is are there issues that we haven't touched on that you think that um Americans who are following this issue closely should be keeping an eye on? Well, I would like to say in general, and I thank you very much for this opportunity to uh you know speak uh, my mind, you know, as an Israeli and who believes that uh, the ties between us uh, should be strong, stronger than ever. Uh, between our countries, uh, and I believe that, you know, this is the way, you know, it will be uh, also after this uh, turbulence uh, that we experience currently and so on. Uh, again, we need a strategy. Israel needs a strategy. We need to basically envisage what is it that we want to see uh, in Gaza, Lebanon, Middle East in general in 10, 15 years. Uh, United States uh, is ought to do the same. Uh, it cannot be this short term, you know, quick fixes. OK, let's fix, fix that. Uh, let's have, you know, this uh, ceasefire that uh, here and there uh, you need to, you know, if you want this war to be the last one, it's not over yet, uh, but uh, it's already proven as, you know, the, you know, deadly and uh, long term war, uh, the longest, I think, in Israeli history, uh, you know, since 48. And uh, this is something that, uh, you know, we need to, you know, involve the best minds, uh, you know, into, you know, working out this long term strategy for both of our countries, you know, and for the Middle East and the region in general. Uh, because it seems to me some, sometimes that, you know, there are different parts of policy that are not attached to others. You know, they are basically, they live in their individual small little world, but they have to be part of the puzzle. Uh, and, you know, for me, I would like to see Middle East post-conflict, uh, free to develop, uh, you know, free 
uh, to uh, grow, free to uh, integrate, you know, between the, you know, moderate uh, elements uh, in our region. You know, I see uh, the growth of uh, not only Abraham Accords, uh, but also, uh, you know, uh, uh, an attempt uh, to, you know, to make an end uh, to the Palestinian-Israeli struggle. Uh, and uh, also to move forward with the Palestinian state eventually, yes, because I don't know any other uh, solution for that. Uh, we need for the big spoiler, which is Iran, uh, to be at least weakened, uh, if not, you know, uh, eliminated in some way. You know, uh, I do not believe that we will be able to achieve it uh, without a meaningful solution, uh, be it diplomatic. I think it's preferable uh, to the military one, you know, uh, that uh, will... Uh, Keep Iran at bay and will allow you know uh, all of the moderates in the Middle East uh, to you know try to achieve the goals. Uh, we have a great region with young population with a lot of opportunities and really we deserve we deserve a different different future and also different present. Yeah, well said. Thank you, Ksenia Svetlova, for joining us uh, once again to help unpack this really volatile moment. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us. Please um, check out the link in the chat um, uh, to learn more about our recent events and our most recent episode of our podcast, Israel Policy Pod, which I hope you will all check out. And um, I hope you're all ready on our uh, list to receive the weekly Koplau column, which no doubt will be unpacking the week's uh, developments uh, as well. Um, and please, um, uh, uh, consider supporting our work uh, at the link that is now in the chat. And thank you all once again for your participation, your feedback, and your support. Uh, we will continue to follow these developments and provide resources um, to help us understand the uh, implications of these ongoing developments and what sort of constructive U.S. policies can navigate us to a future uh, that Ksenia has just, um, I think, so well articulated. Ksenia, thank you very much again, and thank you everyone for joining us. Bye-bye.